Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Living in the West. In previous episodes of Living in the West, we've discussed the issue of the Muslim minorities, the permissibility of them living in the West, the importance of going into this topic. We looked at a vision for this mass of Muslims, whether on a personal or community level. Then we decided looking that we started to go into the actual spheres of life that a Muslim leads and practical application of these strategies. With me, I have Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad from the Muslim Research and Development Foundation from the United Kingdom, an organization and think tank which looks into providing solutions for Muslims in the West. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, in previous episode, Sheikh, uh, we spoke uh, about how to implement these strategies on a social life. Um, you're looking at the social sphere and you gave us an ayah from Surah Muntahina uh, about the people, how to deal with them. This is the non Muslims, to be kind to them, to be just to them, but at the same time to call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second part of this ayah we never really went into. Could we start on this today? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa usalli wa usallim ala al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. In terms of the second ayah, the second ayah mainly is mainly talking about those who fought Muslims. Either fought Muslims because of they are Muslims or fought Muslims just they have enmity towards them as uh, a group of people. Mm -hmm. Because Allah Jalla wa'ala says, They fought you because of your religion. And they drive you, they drove you out of your uh, homes and they helped to drive you out of your homes as well. So those are the enemies of Muslims. Either the enmity because of deen only or because of other reasons plus the enmity of deen. Now, Allah Jalla wa Ala says in the ayah that Allah Jalla wa Ala forbids you to take them alliance. Means the allegiance between Muslims and the enemies, their enemies is totally forbidden and Allah Jalla wa Ala said, وَمَن يَتَوَلَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ The one who is taking them alliances, then they are the wrong doers. Hmm. So this is the general theme that we should not ally with those who fight Muslims. Now, here we have to be very, very careful once we talk about the social interaction. We mentioned before that we have to differentiate between the government and the people. And we said in that in many circumstances, the people go against the uh, policies of the government. They mm -hmm. don't accept the policies of their government. Examples, we have seen many people marching against uh, wars in Iraq and Palestine. We have seen people opposing the uh, policies of their governments in different places in mm -hmm. the world and in Europe. So we should not consider the normal people living around us as our enemies in the deen and that they have fought uh, to drive us out of our homes. So this is, this is a quite important point here. You're yes. saying basically that this eye does not it differentiate between really the people who are living with on a social level to actually the people who are observing the policies and pushing forward the policies. Exactly. Who are fighting the Muslims and driving exactly. them. Exactly. We have to be very, very careful because mixing between those two types of people might uh, leave us into an area of uh, full of problems. Uh, that's why many people think that, okay, the West in general and the Western people are our enemies. Therefore, we should fight all of them on the government level and in the 
uh, very blanket public, kind of view. Yes, mm -hmm. and this is a very dangerous view. And even we said we should not forget that we have said clearly before that there is a social contract between the person living uh, among the non-Muslims, between him and the other non-Muslim people. This is a social contract which you've accepted, not because of you've verbally said it, but it's a tacit approval by them accepting you to be people of justice, people who are living with them, sharing moral exactly. values and stuff. Exactly. Mm. So we have to be careful. So uh, on the other, in this ayah, mm -hmm. we have to be careful also between the government or the governments and the normal people. So uh, this ayah is talking about this. Now this ayah might bring the issue of wala uh, wabara. Okay, mm. it is a very delicate issue, and uh, maybe uh, it is better to leave it at the moment and just to have this general view about the guidelines of dealing with non-Muslims. So, Sheikh, if, if one finds themselves in this situation now, where they live in the West and they live in amongst non-Muslims, they have to be equitable amongst them. They have to be have have kindness towards them, and at the same time give dawah. And we discussed that dawah it comes in several forms. But on the other side, they also have to take into account that the people they're living with are not necessarily the same people who are taking. Because many of the European countries, unfortunately, their armies are in the Muslim lands, and this yeah. is something which we're speaking contextually, openly, like you said. Yeah. So they have to be clear and be careful not to put everybody in the same bag. Exactly. So exactly. So now, but here mm -hmm. we have to. As we are mentioning this point, okay. we have to add a very important point because now what we see mm -hmm. among the Muslims living in um, non-Muslim countries, we see that this social interaction mm -hmm. started to uh, make them melting down that was the okay, question, yeah. within those societies. And this is very, very dangerous. And that's why we said that, yes, it's, it is true that Allah Jalla wa mentioned these two conditions in mm. this ayah, mm. and Allah Jalla wa mentioned the principle or the issue of da'wah in many other ayat. That's why we said giving them da'wah is essential prerequisite before dealing with them. Why? Because giving them da'wah is, is giving you an indirect and strong immunization against their belief system and what we have seen from non-muslims who have been living in non-muslim countries what we have been seeing from some muslims who have been living in non-muslim countries for a long time that they started to lose their identity because of this interaction so this this, this calling to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an actual it's a natural barrier Exactly. And, and he wakes up a person all the time. It's a reality which lives in him. Exactly. That there is a difference. I'm calling him to something which he doesn't have, which I have, which makes me different in the first place. Exactly. That's why we say this da'wah mm. is obligatory. Although, uh, and we might discuss this in, in more details in later episodes, that da'wah in general, the scholars say that da'wah is not really obligatory upon each person. But we say that this statement has to be qualified. And in our situation, where the Muslims are living among non-Muslims, the da'wah becomes obligatory almost upon every single person. Okay, so now we've, we've, we've come to a good conclusion here upon the role of the individual in the society and the, the way he deals with Muslim, the non-Muslims and how to analyze who he's living with. But we have, uh, you know, on a contextual or, shall we say, a very practical basis, we have a, a lot of issues which come about. The mixing uh, with non-Muslims, eating with them, um, you know, the social level of interaction like you spoke about. Visiting them. Visiting them and so forth. How does somebody apply these? Because some of them are very difficult nowadays, and especially with the understanding, like we discussed earlier, of some people, of knowledge, so-called, saying that we have to go not into a participation, uh, or, but rather an assimilation. Of them. How do we deal with this on a practical level, Sheikh? Okay. Yes. Uh, see, we have to be careful here because once we talk about these issues on a public platform, mm -hmm. we have to be very, very careful because situations differ, environments differ, mm -hmm. individual cases differ from other cases. That's why we should give 
general statements and maybe each person facing a different situation should consult trustworthy scholars mm -hmm. about this issue. Take, for example, the issue of visiting. The issue of visiting. Once we observe these three main principles that we have mentioned before, then we see that visiting non-Muslims itself is not something prohibited. Mm -hmm. And it might be encouraged in certain circumstances. I mean, from the son of the Prophet ﷺ, there, there is evidence to show this. So this, and, was, this Yeah, is. we have seen from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ mm -hmm. some examples about visiting mm. the non-Muslims. But again, when we look at these examples, we have to be very, very careful. Let me give you some of those examples and we shed some light uh, about those examples. Uh, I don't know whether time allowed us to talk about these examples, but uh, just two, we will mention some two examples and maybe later on we will discuss them. The first famous incident is the uh, relationship between the Prophet ﷺ and his uncle and the Prophet ﷺ visiting his uncle. The second incident is the Prophet ﷺ visiting a young Jew who used to serve him. These are typical examples about uh, visiting non-Muslims carried out by the Prophet Jazakallah khair. We'll, we'll go into these in a bit of detail after a break. We're going to take uh, a short break and inshallah we turn in a couple of minutes. Please stay with us in Living in the West. <laughs> on the straight path we would like to discuss the niqab from an Islamic and social political perspective. So sometimes some non-Muslims they might not understand the full Islamic pictures. Anyone can say anything about it. Yes. So when can we, who speaks for Islam? Mm -hmm. This is the biggest question. <laughs> who speaks for Islam? Mm -hmm. No they are not sinning, they are not sinning but we are talking about now the general ruling. Mm -hmm. They are not sinning but they are going against what has been established. It is his own ishtihad at a specific time. People would see it as a um, threat. A threat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we explain to them it's not really a threat, it's, it's actually good for the country as well. But if we don't participate, how would we ever reach to our rights? Can you clarify with us what should be the level of political participation of the Muslims in the West? Yeah. Oh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Living in the West. Sheikh Haytham, just before the break, uh, you were speaking uh, about uh, living and visiting non Muslims. You gave two examples. Can we carry on from here? Okay. Bismillah ar Rahman Rahim. The two examples that we have given is the example of the Prophet وسلم, visiting his uncle uh, Abu Talib. And the second example is the Prophet وسلم, give, visiting uh, the uh, a young boy that he used to serve him. Young Jewish boy who used to serve him. Yes, mm -hmm. who was uh, a Jew. Now, the Prophet وسلم, he used to interact with his uncle Abu Talib. And Abu Talib, he was a mushrik. When Abu Talib became sick and he was in the deathbed, the Prophet وسلم, aimed to visit him. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, in Kitab Zad al-Ma'ad, he mentioned those two examples as examples that the Prophet ﷺ visited the non-Muslims. And he mentioned that the purpose behind the visit is to give them da'wah. Does that mean that there are no other examples or there is no other example about the Prophet ﷺ visiting non-Muslims? It looks like. 
Now, the, when the uncle of the Prophet وسلم, Abu Talib became sick, the Prophet وسلم, visited him. Does that mean that the Prophet وسلم, never visited Abu Talib before that? We don't know. And we should not be very uh, critical towards those who are asking this question. Because at the end of the day, we are bounded by the boundaries of the Sharia. We cannot just transgress those boundaries. And we cannot just assume that this is Sharia. No. And the life of the Prophet ﷺ is so rich, that's why we should take all our rulings from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And the life of the Prophet ﷺ never left anything for us. So, uh, this one, the Prophet ﷺ visited Abu Talib and he called him to accept Islam clearly. Mm -hmm. Because Abu Talib is on the deathbed and the Prophet ﷺ will lose him. Abu Talib will go to Jahannam if he does not accept Islam. The other dignitarians were next to Abu Talib and they said to Abu Talib, do you leave the religion of your ancestors and uh, your people? Then Abu Talib was looking at them. He was looking at the Prophet ﷺ and he said, huwa ala dini qawmihi. Yani he is following the deen of his people means he never accepted Islam. The Prophet ﷺ used to have a lot of grievance mm. because of this. And this incident is a very important issue. Why? Because we are telling brothers and sisters, if, the, if you love good for those non-Muslims or you care for them, or sometimes many non-Muslims are doing good things for Muslims, then what is the main thing that you can give or provide to them? The main issue that you can provide them is to save them from the hell fire. Are you talking about what's, what, what is real love, basically? Yeah. Uh, what is real love? And, and that's why we tell people, don't be selfish. Don't be selfish because some people are taking from non-Muslims more than they are giving them. They, sometimes they are shy to give them da'wah. No, brother, sister, don't be shy to give them da'wah because if this person is helping you, is helping Islam, then you would love good for him. What is the best thing you love for him? Is for him to be saved from the hellfire. For him or for her to be with you in the Jannah. That's why we say, brothers and sisters living in the West, don't be shy in giving da'wah. Don't uh, abstain from giving da'wah. Da'wah is your main job. Da'wah is the job of all the prophets. Therefore, if we really, if we visit those uh, non-Muslims, we should have this aim in mind. As I said, directly, or indirectly. The second example mm -hmm. that the Prophet وسلم, used to have a servant uh, who is a non Muslim, who is a Jew, mm -hmm. a young boy. He used to serve the Prophet. Now there is a question why the Prophet وسلم, accepted a Jew to serve him. And obviously, this example is in Medina because there were no Jews in Mecca. Why did the Prophet وسلم, accept a Jew boy to uh, serve him? This is a question, I don't have a clear answer about it. And again, we said some of the details, we might not be able to discuss them and we need uh, maybe fiqh councils to discuss them. But the point here is that uh, when this boy became sick and he was about to die, he went, the Prophet ﷺ went to visit him. And the Prophet ﷺ clearly said to him, Aslim. He looked at the boy and he told him clearly Aslim. Again, this is what? Out of love for that boy. Out of love good for that boy. The good he wants for that person. The good f he wants for that person. And sometimes we fool ourselves. We think that being good, nice to people means good and nice to them in the dunya. But what will happen to them after death we don't care about it. No, this is not love good for them. Actually, the, the doctor sometimes is telling you some bad news in order to protect you from what the 
consequences of that illnesses. And that's why sometimes even we might be very forward with non-Muslims about the reality of their religion, what out of love good for them. If we love good for them means we love them to accept Islam and then they will go to Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ clearly said to that boy, Aslim, accept Islam. And look what happened. The boy looked at his father and his father is a Jew. Yes. Subhanallah. And this hadith, by the way, is in Sahih al-Bukhari. He looked at his father. This is this gives an indication that the Prophet ﷺ, when he was dealing with that Jew, with the, that boy, he was so kind and he was so just with him that this person, he was not rejecting the call of the Prophet ﷺ. And this reminds us that Allah Jalla wa ala said about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَأُوفُ الرَّحِيمِ He is keen, he is so keen about his uh, people. Now, either his people, the Muslims or the non-Muslim, but about the non-Muslim, he is so keen that those non-Muslims accept Islam. So the young boy looked at the, his father, consulting his father, which shows that this boy has a good etiquette. Now, this is amazing that the, the father, who is a Jew, who has not accepted Islam, and there are no reports that this person accepted Islam, looked at the boy and he said to him, Obey Abel Qasim. Atay Abel Qasim. Mm. And this is a very amazing hadith, subhanAllah. Mm. Which means that this Jew knows that the Prophet وسلم, is a prophet, knows that he is upon the truth. That's why Allah Jalla wa Ala says in the Quran, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ That among the people of the book, those who know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a prophet more than they know their children. And this reminds us of the story of Safiya when she said that uh, one time her father, mm -hmm. Safiya, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, bin Tuhiyay, when she said, once my father uh, went to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he arrived to Medina, and with, along, with his, uh, along with my uncle, both went to see the Prophet وسلم, to investigate the situation. And she said, I used to be the most beloved person to my father and he used to hug me and kiss me if he sees me. And she said, uh, when he was coming he did, and he saw me, he did not bother about me. And he was talking to my uncle, is he the one who was described to us? And they, he said to him, yes, he is the one who was described to us. Means they knew that the Prophet ﷺ is the real Prophet. So that Jew told uh, his son, Ati Abel Qasim, then that boy accepted Islam, subhanAllah, just before death. And he died as a Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ was very happy and he said, Alhamdulillah alladhi anqadahu bi min al -nar. Look at the aim of the Prophet ﷺ. That's why we tell those Muslims who just socialize for the purpose of socializing with non-Muslims. Be careful. You might be cheating them if you don't call them for Islam. At the day of resurrection, those non-Muslims will come to you and they will complain to Allah Jalla wa Ala that those Muslims used to live among us, they never invited us to Islam. They never clarified us the reality of Islam. They never warned us against the matter, consequ okay. consequences mm. of not accepting Islam. So it's a very serious matter. I mean, people take it very lightly sometimes. They exactly. don't want to offend. They don't want to look out of place. So they don't, they say, okay, our da'wah is our manners and so forth. But they're very, very scared of actually saying anything sometimes too. Exactly. And the real offensive is what? To leave them as non-Muslims. And we all know that Allah Jalla wa Ala promised those non-Muslims or those kafirin, promised them that they will go to hellfire. That's why the Prophet ﷺ was very keen to call any non-Muslim to Islam and he called that Jew to accept Islam. These are two examples and these two examples manifest clearly that the main aim behind the visit or that social, that level of social interaction between the Prophet ﷺ and the non-Muslims was to call them 
to Islam. So very briefly, we were saying we have to have a kindness with them, justice to them, but at the same time we can't forget this, this thing about da'wah, and this goes to our relationship, basically, that the relationship has to have one where we're always aiming to call the person to Islam. Exactly. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Haytham al-Haddad. Well, that's all the time we have for you today on this episode of Living in the West. Please join me next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.